I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar series. I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today's presentation is about the five most important things to know about GPA. These webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Novar Novartis, for supporting these webinars. And we are grateful today to have Dr. Jason Springer with us to educate us about GPA. Dr. Jason Springer is, is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Immunology and Rheumatology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the co-director of the Vanderbilt Vasculitis Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Springer. I, I'm so happy to have you here with us today. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And if you wouldn't mind, if you have any disclosures, would you give them to us at this time? Uh, yeah, so uh, I uh, served as a consultant for uh, chemocentrics in regards to evacopan, and that one's relevant to today's lecture today. Okay, great. And if you would like to share your screen, we would love to learn more about GPA. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things that I think are important in, from a patient standpoint to know in terms of uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis or GPA. Uh, remember, this used to be called uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, but the name has changed to GPA. And we'll advance my slide here. There we go. Um, so some of the things we will be talking about are some of the symptoms to monitor for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the treatment team, um, a general framework on how we approach treatment, um, some of the specific medications we use, and uh, duration of therapy. And so this slide summarizes uh, some of the manifestations of GPA. Um, as you can see, it can affect almost any organ system. Um, and we'll start here on the left. Uh, so it, it, this lists some of the um, medical terms, but uh, um, it can affect the eyes. Uh, and some of the symptoms that uh, you can have with the eyes include uh, eye redness, eye pain, or sudden vision loss. Um, sometimes it can affect the sinuses as well, uh, um, where you get uh, inflammation in the sinuses and uh, or sinusitis. It can sometimes uh, affect the shape of the nose, causing what's called a saddle nose. Um, it can cause mouth or nose ulcers. Um, it can affect the lungs. So sometimes this includes uh, inflammatory uh, balls of tissue in the lungs, uh, or what we call nodules, or sometimes it can be very dramatic with bleeding in the lungs. Um, it can also affect the lining of the lungs. Um, typically this presents as uh, pain with deep breaths. Um, it can affect the kidneys. Um, typically, uh, when there's kidney involvement, it, it uh, you won't have symptoms of this until it's pretty far along. And uh, this will first present as microscopic blood in the urine. Um, it can affect the muscles, uh, generally presenting as uh, pain or weakness in the muscles. Uh, it can cause joint pains. Um, it can affect the uh, peripheral nerves. Uh, this typically will present as uh, a persistent uh, weakness or numbness in uh, the uh, hands, arms, or legs. Um, it can affect the skin, and the most typical rash is something that is typically on the um, on the lower legs, and it presents as these pinpoint red dots. And then they can get bigger and look almost like bruises, and actually get raised. Um, it can affect the heart, um, either causing inflammation in the actual heart muscle itself or the lining around the heart. Typically, this will present as a chest pain. Um, and then it can affect any part of the airways, so the trachea or uh, the bronchioles going into the lungs. And this generally presents as uh, um, shortness of breath, and it causes narrowing of these airways. Um, it can affect the ears, uh, and this uh, uh, can present as either uh, ear pain or hearing loss, and it can uh, present very similarly to an ear infection. Um, and then less commonly, it can uh, present, uh, it can uh, affect the brain, and typically this is fairly dramatic when it occurs, so it's things like uh, cognitive changes, seizures, strokes, things like that. Um, now we talked about these uh, uh, granul uh, these nodules that can form in the lungs, which what we, what we call granulomas. So these are little balls of inflammatory tissue, and they can present in other places as well around the body. 
So as far as a uh, treatment team, so it's really variable, um, but uh, I, I list here some of the more common specialists that uh, are seen. It's definitely not an exhaustive list, and some patients may need other specialists that's not, that are not listed here. Um, so I'm a rheumatologist, and it's not uncommon for rheumatologists to coordinate the care and the treatment. Um, but sometimes this, uh, uh, there are other specialists that are coordinating the treatment, like pulmonologists or nephrologists. Um, the pulmonologists or lung doctors are very helpful if there's airway involvement or if there is uh, lung nodules or um, if there is uh, fibrosis in the lungs, they can help uh, to monitor these things. Uh, the nephrologist or kidney doctor is very helpful if there is uh, kidney damage and they can help monitor that. And they can also help with uh, decisions on dialysis and transplant if needed. Um, the primary care uh, provider is still very important. Uh, you still need somebody to uh, help with your general health care, uh, but also, you know, we use medications that can affect the immune system. So vaccinations are important to keep track of. Uh, dermatologists can be helpful if you need a skin biopsy. Sometimes we need those biopsies to uh, confirm vasculitis of the skin. Um, and also they can help with treatment of the skin when there's uh, the, uh, resistant or severe skin involvement. Um, ENT specialists can help if there is uh, upper airway involvement or involvement of the sinuses or ears. Sometimes they can do procedural things that uh, help out with what we're doing. Um, a neurologist or nerve doctor can help if there is brain or peripheral nerve involvement. Um, and then if there's eye involvement, an ophthalmologist can be very helpful because they have the tools to help monitor the eyes that uh, uh, you know, other specialists won't. And so how do we approach treatment of GPA? Well, we tend to break this up into phases. So we have what's called an induction phase. And in this phase, the disease is active. And we want to make sure that we uh, control uh, the disease fairly quickly and control that inflammation. Uh, also, our goal is to prevent organ damage and prevent infections. And we hope to get in a remission state. And uh, remission basically means no evidence of active disease. And then after we're in remission, we're in a maintenance phase. And uh, this is an important phase as well because this disease can relapse. So one of our main goals is to prevent relapses, but we always wanna uh, minimize the amount of steroids we're using as well as try to prevent side effects from medications, prevent infections and improve quality of life. And so this lists some of the medications that have been shown to be effective in each of these phases. So uh, when the disease is uh, first active or relapsing, we first need to decide if it's severe or non-severe. And so severe basically means any life or organ threatening manifestations. And we want to be more aggressive in those situations. And so medications like cyclophosphamide and have been shown to be effective there. And in non-severe, we sometimes use methotrexate. Now, these agents are, are always combined with something else, either glucocorticoids or now a vacopan uh, can help uh, reduce or eliminate steroids. Um, and then after remission, there's several maintenance agents that have been shown to be effective, uh, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, and rituximab. So one of the most common questions I think I get is how long do you need to be on therapy? And it's not an easy question to answer. Um, so keep in mind that, uh, you know, this, we have multiple studies that have addressed this question, but the studies have to stop at some point. And most of the studies have stopped somewhere between two and four years. Um, so that's, you know, that's the duration of data that we have. Um, but I, there are several factors that I take into account uh, when uh, deciding on the duration of therapy. And so I think it's important to remember that the duration of therapy may not be the same for everyone. So uh, I consider the severity of the disease in the past. So has there been any organ damage, uh, for instance, uh, like in the kidneys, sometimes you can get damage to the kidneys. And there may not be uh, a lot of residual kidney function left and potentially having a uh, flare in those organs could be devastating. And so I may be less likely to come off of maintenance therapy in those situations. Um, also, you know, we use the ANCA test, which is a lab test. We use that for diagnosis, uh, but there's a, um, a subtype of the ANCA called the PR3. 
And we know that people that have positivity to PR3, they are at higher risk of relapse. And so I may be less likely to come off of therapy. Um, also, we consider, you know, has there been any side effects to the medications or infections? Because we do need to weigh the uh, risk and benefits of these well. Uh, now, there are guidelines that came out um, in terms of management uh, in maintenance therapy, and uh, the Vasculitis Foundation actually helped uh, come up with some of these guidelines, and they recommend that uh, you should be on therapy for at least two to four years, um, and maybe some cases. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for um, giving us those top five reason overview of GPA. And I did want to say to our viewers that today is just actually an overview of GPA, short, high level. We are only addressing a few questions today, but we'll be doing a live GPA webinar in the near future. So be opportunity for a lot more questions in the future. But if you don't mind, Dr. Springer, I did want to ask you a couple of questions about what you told us today, if that's okay. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, so the first one is, and this is probably a loaded question, but what phase of GPA should be, do you feel like should be getting the most research focus? Is it more important to diagnose GPA earlier? Is it achieving and maintaining remission? Or is it about maybe doing studies about dependence on steroids or, or are all three of these equally important? Well, I, I think they're all important, definitely. Uh, I think we are in a phase where people really want to try to reduce or eliminate the steroids because we know that the steroids have a lot of side effects. So I think that is a focus right now. Um, also, I think uh, there is a lot of attention on maintenance therapy and specifically with rituximab because I, th I think we're using rituximab a lot more now. And uh, we want to know the best ways to use rituximab over time. And uh, there, there I, there's a lot of smart people working on that exact question, so. Okay, great. Thanks for your answer on that. Next question. Could Dr. Springer name two or three of the current studies that he thinks personally might be the most promising or and why you chose those studies? Oh, the studies that would be the most promising. Um, Let's see, I, I think, uh, you know, we are getting more studies on longer term uh, of Vacopan. Uh, you know, we, the Vacopan studies have uh, been um, more shorter term, you know, um, it, going on for a year. And uh, th there are planned studies on, um, you know, looking at uh, whether we should be long term or maybe stopping it sooner. So uh, I think that's an important question that I'm interested in. Um, uh, let's see, any other studies? I uh, Yeah, I, I, um, I think the rituximab studies that, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's studies that are looking at other B cell depleting agents. Um, and I think that would be interesting too, in terms of uh, something that kind of works like rituximab, but maybe depletes the B cells, uh, the target of rituximab for longer periods of time. Um, yeah, I think uh, that those are interesting studies as well. Well, thank you. I know that patients are talking about both of those. So we're glad that you also find those studies interesting. Um, the next one came from a patient that was originally diagnosed with PAN. Uh, but then it was determined that he actually had GPA. He wants to know, is this common to have one of the other types of vasculitis and then be reclassified as GPA? And if so, what, the, what other types typically turn out to be GPA? And does it really matter if we're changed from PAN to GPA in terms of actual treatment? Yeah, um, so I think it's important to, uh, so, so taking a step back, if you think of uh, uh, how are we frame the different forms of vasculitis, so we tend to break it up in terms of large, medium, and small vessel vasculitis, uh, and, you know, PAN, or polaritis nodosa, is a medium vessel vasculitis, whereas GPA is a small vessel vasculitis, but, um, you know, there is overlap there. So, you know, some of the same vessels that can be involved with PAN uh, can be involved with GPA as well. And so it can be uh, confusing initially, especially at the beginning, you know. Um, 
And so uh, the antibodies, the ANCA antibodies can definitely help us out there because most GPA patients are going to be ANCA positive. So that, that helps in terms of differentiating those two. Now, I do think it is important that we do differentiate the two because the treatment is different. You know, um, uh, we have a lot of studies in, um, in GPA uh, and how we should treat GPA. Um, in PAN, we don't have as many studies um, and you would treat it a little bit differently. You know, like uh, for instance, um, in PAN, um, I would be less apt to use uh, rituximab, whereas I use rituximab a lot in GPA. So I do think it does matter differentiating the two. Okay, thank you so much. And, and uh, I just wanna say to all the viewers that are watching, we would like to suggest that you visit the uh, GPA page on the Vasculitis Foundation's website. You can find all kinds of information about it there if you're newly diagnosed or current treatments, any research that's going on. So that's a great resource for you. And that would be on vasculitisfoundation.org website. And thank you, Dr. Springer, for taking the time to share with us today. We, we totally appreciate you, as always, giving us your time. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Astra, AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Novartis, as well as, of course, the Vasculitis Foundation for providing these educational webinars.